Welcome to this podcast, which is a discussion about consciousness, about reality, about who we are, about what we can do about it. Dr. Professor Anil said, a great uh, scientist in this field who has written a great book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, and he proposes an idea of the human mind as a highly evolved prediction machine. And this is rooted in the functions of the body and how actually we are constantly hallucinating the world and the self to create reality. Welcome, Anil. It's a joy to be with you. You want to tell us a little bit about your interest, why you got into the study of consciousness? What were your initial interests? Was it something scientific or personal search in life for understanding reality? Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here. And my interest in consciousness goes back to when I was a kid. And I, I don't think I'm particularly odd in that respect. I think many of us, when, when we're young, we start to ask these big questions about who am I? Um, what happens when I die? Where was I before I was born? Why am I here? These sorts of things. And uh, for most people, I think you, you end up getting educated out of these questions and doing something more sensible in life. But for me, these questions about what it means to be me, where does experience come from? Where does consciousness come from? These, these questions hung around and started to, to develop. And as I learned more about science, and I started off really in, in physics, it became pretty clear that this was a mystery that that science, as I understood it, you know, from a very limited perspective in the early days, just didn't touch. And it was still this big mystery in both science and as I later discovered in philosophy too. But I certainly didn't set out with, with any grand strategic plan to have a career in the science of consciousness. In that sense, I was quite lucky that just as I was going through my undergraduate and then postgraduate studies, consciousness became once again a legitimate thing to do research in, in neuroscience, in psychology, um, and in sort of this multidisciplinary area, philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, and computer science, physics too. And so I got swept along with that wave and was very lucky to be trained by some people who were very active in this rehabilitation of consciousness uh, research. And so it has indeed ended up being what, what I do as a career, but it really, those questions never, never left me and I'm grateful for that. And do you feel you have the answers, the full answers, or you are now on the level of possibilities, theories, intuition? I certainly don't think I've got all the answers at all. Um, and that's kind of what makes it exciting at the moment, that looking more broadly at the field of, of consciousness science, as it's described, there are a number of different theories, and they, they're often theories about different aspects of consciousness. They make different assumptions, but it's a very putting a little bit of an optimistic hat on it's a very fertile landscape right now and um we what strikes me when i think about having an answer or not now that that's that's not good that's not the case but i do think that certainly i personally have learned an awful lot more about consciousness over the course of the last 20 25 years and i think the questions have changed just as much as any potential answers and i think that that's a mark of progress as much as anything, if we start asking questions differently. This is wonderful. We don't have the full answers, but your book has contributed, which means your research has contributed in a very profound way to understanding a number of factors and variables that can lead to uh, us having an intuition, having a kind of theory that makes sense. And your book has been so, uh, well received it was a sunday times uh, top 10 bestseller a new statements book of the year an economist book of the year a bloomberg business book of the year a guardian book of the week and a guardian and financial times science book of the year so this been a number of people who have been impressed by <laughs> by what you have written and i have been too it's really wonderful Oh, thank you very much. I mean, it is incredibly gratifying. And, and you know, there's a funny thing. It's the first book I've written for a general audience. And 
you know, when you write a book like this, for me, it was just as much I was getting frustrated by not having written down everything I thought about the subject in one place. So it was more of a scratching an itch as much as anything else. And I honestly forgot about the prospect that other people might read it, let alone benefit from it. So it's been incredibly pleasing to see over the last uh, few months that it's been out that it has found uh, quite a wide audience and that people have indeed found some benefit in it. And that's it's really it's a lovely thing. Wonderful. If I remember well, um, in one of your TED Talks, you start by saying consciousness is all there is. It was very gratifying because our podcast is called Consciousness is All There Is. And when one, <laughs> when one hears your descriptions at the beginning, one feels that maybe there is nothing but the physical reality and uh, what then is consciousness and as we know just for our listeners and viewers uh, we can say that just a summary which i think any discussion of consciousness has to highlight you know that starting with descartes and the dualist vision that there are two realities one physical one non-physical one is awareness consciousness actually the other is the physical universe and then more and more as science uh, unfolded and logic and philosophy, we have all merged into the idea of a unified reality that we couldn't really have two because how they would talk to each other, how they would influence each other. And then you get two camps. One is a camp starting with the physical, the physicalist and a camp starting with consciousness. And these two camps are not exactly equal because even if you start with the physical, some end up like Dennett and others. I had a nice talk with Dr. Keith Frankish where he describes that it's an illusion. Consciousness is an illusion. So you can start with the physical reality and up with consciousness as an illusion. And there is, uh, you know, another in the physicalist where it is an emergence and then you have weak emergence, you have strong emergence and this this kind of vision and then on the other side you have the panpsychists who think maybe consciousness is everywhere but even there there is a difference because for example my point of view or whatever i discuss with our discussion groups and with our uh, interviews and all of that is that actually consciousness is all there is that ultimately it's an idealist point of view now we face in both camps the problem of how the other emerges from the one now just to to tell our our uh, viewers and listeners the position of dr anil said uh, would you like to describe like your i guess if i can say physicalist but you think emergence is real or consciousness is real that's right. By the way, thank you. you. You've done my job for me, really, in setting out the, the landscape so beautifully. Um, that's indeed the rough two poles out of the philosophy of consciousness. But I would say that panpsychism is not necessarily identical to idealism, because for some panpsychists, consciousness is an extra component of physical, otherwise physical reality. So they um, are dualists. Idealism. That, well, that, I mean, they would say it's, it's fundamental, so you don't have two, you know, two different domains just as much as you don't have to be a dualist to assume that mass and you know, energy or mass and charge are, are different aspects of fundamental reality. But, you know, I'm not a panpsychist, so that's fine anyway. Um, <laughs> I am indeed, I would describe myself as a pragmatic materialist. Uh, and the reason being that a materialist perspective has served science very very well over the past has dissolved many previous mysteries it gives us a set of intellectual conceptual and philosophical tools for uh, engaging with whatever actually is out there and understanding it being able to explain phenomena in the universe and predict and control these these phenomena um, but i am not a uh, what I would say a hard illusionist trying to say oh consciousness actually doesn't exist all there exists is machinery in our head and this is why I say that consciousness is all there is but I actually said consciousness for each of us is all there is it's a very subtle difference but otherwise it sounds very idealistic right I all you know from idealism that there's only consciousness and what I what I mean is is something I first heard from 
some of my inspirations are uh, like Giulio Tononi and Gerald Edelman, who who I was inspired by 25 years ago when I was starting. I'm going to start this way. They say that consciousness is for each of us everything there is. Everything that we ex- everything that happens to us happens because of consciousness. You know, we are only aware of things that happen in the medium of consciousness. It's a bit tautological to say so, but it's nonetheless true. So I take conscious phenomena as existing. We have experiences. I have an experience of talking to you right now, of looking out the window at the houses on the other side of the street. These experiences are for me real, and they depend in intimate ways on the brain and the body. The nature of that intimate dependence is the question. Of course, one prospect is they inhabit these different domains and they're going to be very hard to fit together in any sensible way. This is always the problem faced by dualism. But the ambition and the hope is that a sufficiently sophisticated advanced uh, materialism will resolve that problem, or at least to an extent that makes the science of consciousness useful so there's a couple of things going on here like one is science doesn't always have to explain absolutely everything about a phenomenon like we don't know why a universe is is present you know, physics is brilliant but it hasn't told us why reality exists in the first place but it's still very useful so we might get most of the way but not all the way there we might never know why does consciousness exist as part of the universe but if we can explain why it's expressed in its, in the way it is in humans, in other animals, in any system, then we're doing the job that science is, is able to do. And for that, I think materialism has the best set of tools. Wonderful. You, you of course, say materialism, which um, in a sense is physicalism more than today, because material means the objects are only localized in time and space and they are solid. And... Uh, we do tend, tend to say, well, there is also quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, and there is non-locality and entanglement and all of this, and matter is actually energy. So I guess, you, you know, people tended to say, well, let's call it physicalism, which means that there is something physical, whatever it is, an energy that then appears as localized matter on the classical level. So then we have a great physicalist who also believes in consciousness as being uh, or somehow an emergent uh, quality uh, that is very real and that we live our life through that. So the definition of consciousness is let's a function and let's take a functional definition uh, in the sense of moments of experience. So what is consciousness is like I have a moment of experience as Anil just told us we're talking to each other he's aware of me you're aware of uh, him and myself and of the discussion happening so in these moments of experience if we can divide them into moments there are observers there is objects of observation and there is some process that links the observer to the process, uh, to the object of observation. You know, you look at the flower, the light shines on the flower, goes through the eyes, there is a process that takes place. And then there is that conscious observer that says it's a flower. So if we can say that these are the moments of reality that we know on the surface level, now we want to see, and this goes back to your book and your, of course, beautiful contribution, that this moment of experience is not dependent only on the object, but also on the observer and practically also on the process, because if the light is different, if the situation is different, you might have a different appreciation of the object. So I feel that one of the very profound uh, also uh, thinking and discovery and contribution that you have done is to show the extent to which the observer participates and influences the outcome of this moment of experience. We can call this moment of experience a bit of consciousness, like a unit, one linear unit, one moment of experience. So do you want to tell us like how you came to that and uh, why the objects are not just sitting out there as we see them, but that we actually create also, as you say, uh, the phenomenon of experience sure 
I'm happy to do that. I think, let me just tie up a couple of loose ends of the things you mentioned before though, but you're quite right when it comes to physicalism, materialism, that m most people who would describe themselves, including me as, as materialists, are very open to uh, a, rich, a richer description of what physical reality might be, including whatever quantum mechanical weirdnesses yeah. uh, are happening down at that scale. That's all fine. Um, and this idea, this definition then of, of consciousness as a, as a moment, I, I, I quite like that. Of course, there's an interesting phenomenology to the flow of time too. You know, we, we, Husserl talks about this a lot. You know, do we, is a conscious moment it's partly in the past, it's, it's partly in the future. Um, and while a defining characteristic of consciousness is that it's private and subjective, so that, which makes it, that is one of the things that makes it hard to study. Like I can't put a conscious experience on the table and, and look at it in a way that we can all, agree about it you know, it's it's private it's happening for me um, but it doesn't necessarily have to involve the experience of being an observer right? I think that I think that's kind of key so a lot of people often conflate consciousness with the experience of self with self-consciousness and um, part of the the argument I make in the book and many other people have made too is is that these things are separable and in humans they often go together but perhaps not always there are some perhaps states of flow or meditation or pharmacological conditions where that's not the case uh, but the most fundamental definition of consciousness is any kind of subjective experience whatsoever um, which may or may not include an experience of being a self within that sorry so for that that just tying those those things up this idea then of, of the observer participating, playing a role in this um, relationship between how things seem in our conscious experience to how things are. Yeah, you're right. That's been a fundamental theme. And it is, a, like many things, it's, it's not a new idea at all. There's often in the history of philosophy and in perception and neuroscience been a lot of discussion about how do you how do the contents of our conscious experience, the colors and shapes and people and places, how do they relate to what's actually out there in the world to physical um, reality? That's why it's called and, phenomenology. It's a phenomenon. It's not yeah. like an essence of something that we see. That's exactly right. And so I think one of the things that, that I hope, the directions that I hope consciousness science evolves in is to take the practice of phenomenology more seriously. Francisco Varela was talking about this 34 years ago um, in terms of neurophenomenology. Now, there's a lot to explain about experience. It's not just simply like the difference between being conscious or not conscious. There's a richness and a diversity to our experiences that, that provide many explanatory targets, many things that we should try to understand. Like an experience of emotion is very different from an experience of seeing a cat on a table or something like that. They're just different kinds of experiences and they have different phenomenological properties. But I think what's common to all the experiences we have is this, is their indirect nature. And this is quite tricky for most people and, and for me as well, because our experiences don't have that character. They don't seem to be indirect, right? You open your eyes, and it seems as though you see the world as it is. And that, that feature, that feature of your experience, that it seems to be real, I think is often overlooked. Again, because it's not always there. We can have lucid dreams when we know that we're dreaming. And so suddenly we're having rich experiences that we know aren't, aren't real. And, and in certain hallucinations, that can be the case too. But most of the time, it seems as though what we experience is a direct reflection of what's really there. But of course, we know this isn't the case and from from when we we're very young, if we've played around with visual illusions. We know we can be deceived um, by certain situations. But I think the real lesson is that that's happening all the time and, and everywhere. Plato talked about this, this is the allegory of the cave, that prisoners in this cave seeing shadows cast on the walls of the cave by a fire. They take the shadows to be real because that's all they know. Um, and I think the same applies to us, that we, you know, our brains are locked inside this cave of the skull. All they get are these indirect electrical signals through the sensory organs, the eyes and the ears, and the nose and so on, that 
only indirectly reflect what's out there. And so the brain has to make an interpretation. It has to make a best guess of what's actually out in the world that is the most likely cause or the most relevant aspect of the cause of the sensory signals that comes in. And, and the argument uh, in, in my book and elsewhere is that that's what we perceive. It's, it's the brain's most useful interpretation of the, of the sensory data, whether that comes from the world or from the body. That's beautiful. Uh, just to clarify, of course, uh, in Plato's perception, these uh, ideas, which he calls the ideas or the forms, uh, he suggests that they exist uh, as an essence, as a noumena, as Kant says, in a, in a world that is ideal. And uh, then what we are seeing are the shadows of that. Um, but if I understand well your, your perception of that is that there is no such existence outside uh, outside the phenomenal world that we experience and on which we project our expectations and therefore hallucinations. So those ideal um, forms from your perspective, the noumena, the essence, the quiddities, um, of course they must exist somehow, but they exist physically. They're not like mathematical, or abstract uh, forms, because if, if we were to say that, then you're coming into my camp where <laughs> I would say, well, it's an idealist uh, thing, and I have to explain how from one unbounded consciousness, one ocean of consciousness, there are waves and ripples of its own interaction with itself that lead to those forms and all possible forms that then you know, we can uh, embody and experience uh, ourselves. I don't know if I made myself clear. Yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see how our two perspectives align or, or, or don't align in this in this conversation. But yes, so I, I'm actually fairly aligned. I think Kant is indeed a better reference point than, than Plato because I'm not, I've, I don't talk much about whether you know, mathematical forms as abstractions have this have this um, intrinsic existence, but I'm more comfortable with this idea that that there is stuff out there, the the Kant's Newman, as you say, um, but that stuff is only ever indirectly revealed to us through our perceptual experience, hidden behind a sensory veil, as as many people have called it. And the challenge, of course, is that that's not how it seems in our perceptual experience. Um, and there are, there, are, there are also different gradations of this. So I think it was, was Locke who distinguished primary and secondary qualities. So color is a very good example of something that very naively might seem to exist objectively in the world, where I look at a red car and it seems to be red, and that redness seems to be a property of the car that's got nothing to do with my mind or brain. But you don't have to do very much psychology or physics to realize that that's not true. Um, it takes a mind, a brain, and a car with very with surfaces with particular reflectances to get redness. Uh, Cezanne said, "Color is where the, the brain and the universe meet." Um, but there are other things like solidity uh, and perhaps movement, which are primary qualities, which seem to exist in a stronger sense in the absence of a mind to observe them, and. So there's already some interesting distinctions about what exists in a mind independent sense and how our experience, if you like, represents things existing in that way. Beautiful, beautiful. So if, if we go from this simple uh, three values of observer, process and observed, then there is something to the observed some kind of reality uh, and there is a reality to the observer and then what we perceive as reality is the combination of these so reality is different in different modes of functioning of the nervous system or i would call it in different modes of consciousness or different states of consciousness and you have beautifully described in your book how uh, consciousness is not just one thing uh, that one experience, you also differentiate it from intelligence and uh, describe the different uh, 
levels of consciousness in animals and that they are really different. So reality for different individuals is different based on their state of functioning. Uh, you say of the state of the nervous system, I stay of the dynamics of their consciousness. Uh, but then we have these different, do you want uh, layers of, of consciousness that you even took to the smallest uh, insects even in, in the book, which is fascinating. Uh, I'm sure everyone who is listening to us would like to hear something about this, except if you'd like to comment about other aspects uh, that you brought up. No, absolutely. There's one thing I did want to pick up on, though, because it's something that I've been doing since the book was, was published. Um, and it's, it does pick up on this idea that even among humans, even you know, between you and me or, or, the, or the listeners now, we have different brains. We're similar in many ways, but we're going to be slightly different. Just as we're slightly different on the outside, we're all going to be slightly different on the inside too. And we're all going to have subtly and perhaps sometimes dramatically different experiences of what is real and what's really out there. We're going to have different perceptual experiences, live in different inner universes. And I've become really fascinated by this. Sometimes we see it happen at the fringes, there was this famous image of a dress a few years ago that was blue and black for half the world and white and gold for the other half. And everyone goes crazy about that. It's like, no, but how can we see the same thing differently? The trick is that that's happening all the time. It's just use, usually at a more subtle level where we use the same words for things. So we might not even, even notice. Uh, you know, again, there might be extra sort of more extreme points like synesthesia, the mixing of the senses, or perhaps autism, where people have a higher sensory sensitivity. But one of the projects that we're launching very soon, when we're having this conversation in June 2022, um, should be launched within a few weeks, is called the Perception Census, which is, I think, one of the first large-scale research programs to try to measure and map out this uncharted terrain of perceptual diversity, how we all experience things slightly differently. I just think it's been massively overlooked and it's potentially very, very um, important to know because when we recognize that we see the world differently, I think that can build empathy and, and build connection uh, between people. So that's a little bit of a sidebar just to, to tell you about a new thing. But indeed, there are these other questions then about, okay, what will the world of experience be like for, for other creatures. Um, the Jakob von Erk school talked about this as the Umwelt, yeah. a lovely uh, German word for the, for the perceptual universe of, of other creatures, that for a bee, it's going to be very different. There's going to be infrared or ultraviolet, I never remember which, but you know, they see flowers in, in, in very differently from us. But of course, we cannot we cannot have the immediate subjective experience of being a different creature without actually being that creature. Thomas Nagel says this very eloquently in his, his famous paper, what is it like to be a bat? But we can sort of make some inferences about it, at least about how different the inner world might be. And to some extent, this is a bit of speculation, but I think it's an informed uh, speculation. So I talk quite a lot in the book about octopuses as being a pretty remarkably different species um, that have a very decentralized brain that sense the world and the body in, in very different ways. And just wondering what the inner world of an octopus uh, might be like, because Peter Godfrey Smith in his wonderful book, Other Minds, talks about this very beautifully too. But I, I spent a week with octopuses about, oh God, um, more than 10 years ago now, and it really stayed with me as being in the presence of creatures sharing a common physical environment, but experiencing that very differently. Now, there's one big caveat to all this, which is the, the assumption that other creatures are in fact conscious. They're not just unconsciously perceiving their environment in their species-specific ways. And the question of how to establish this has been source of great controversy in, in neuroscience and animal behavior for a very long time. And I think here we're caught between two, two tendencies. 
and it's difficult to get out of this trap. On the one hand, we use humans as a benchmark because we know that we are conscious, so we can use similarity to humans, whether it's in terms of brain anatomy and dynamics or behavior, we can use that similarity as, a, as something by which to infer mental similarity and similarity of consciousness in others. And that's fine, you know, we, we pretty comfortable most, I would imagine pretty much everybody is comfortable with primates, monkeys and the great apes and so on being conscious, even if not exactly like us, but it becomes harder the further you go. So what about birds? What about octopuses? What about fruit flies? And then you can go to the other extreme and say, we should not be dominated by this kind of anthropocentric and anthropomorphic view of other minds. But then on what basis do you make, um, make the call? You say, you say consciousness is a property of everything that lives. Uh, that seems hard to justify as well, just because we know in humans that it's easy to lose consciousness. Now we can, we can have brains with a lot of activity without any consciousness happening at all. So if you get down to an organism you know, with maybe 300 neurons, like a C. elegans worm, is that enough for even any kind of conscious experience? I, I don't think anybody can give a definitive answer, but it's at these fringes that our intuitions, I think, become very, very unreliable, and we should just acknowledge their unreliability. This is wonderful. It brings us actually to kind of the hard definition of consciousness, uh, that it's anthropomorphic and that if there is consciousness, it should be like my consciousness. But we realize that even us, we go through dreaming, we go through deep sleep, we go through drowsiness, and we have different states of consciousness, even in advanced techniques of meditation, such as transcendental meditation, people experience higher states of consciousness where they feel unbounded, they feel one with everything. And this has very, very uh, important uh, contribution to the physical well-being, to the behavior. So it has a positive uh, impact on on the, on the physical level, if we like to call it as separate from consciousness. So there are these, if, if we wanna really look at consciousness uh, in animals, as you say, we have to accept that it's different. You know, the animal might, you know, the insect might not have a sense of self. We know that not all animals recognize themselves in the mirror, uh, some do. Uh, and as we go down in the phylogenetic tree, we find lesser reactions, lesser tool usage, lesser intelligence, if you like, even though intelligence is a different phenomenon than consciousness. And this is where, just to share with you, um, in the understanding that consciousness is all there is from an idealist point of view, uh, we can consider any sensing, any detecting, any reacting, as being within the range of possibilities of consciousness. It can be very simple sensing, and that is very limited consciousness. So do we want to accept that there could be limited consciousness and higher and higher and higher consciousness until we get to the sense of self and then we go to meta consciousness where we are conscious of being conscious and then potentially higher states of consciousness. And in that sense, we can extend the definition of consciousness to include even inanimate objects because they react to each other either through gravity or through electromagnetism. I know I'm pushing this a little bit uh, far, but just to, to give you a hint of you know, where the positioning is and the logic of how we can come from an idealism to explain the physicalness of reality. Yeah, you're certainly pushing it further than, than I would go, um, based on, on, on my perspective. Um, you know, that's fine. That's what that's what that perspective warrants. I, I was going to ask you, actually, because when you say that minimal amount of sensing and responding would be a sufficient basis to attribute consciousness to, well, then, of course, you go you go outside simple organisms and you start thinking about, you know, well, what about a, a robot? You know, even, even something like Gray Walters tortoises he was building in the 1950s 
or Breitenberg's vehicles, which are just a few wires that connect a photo uh, detector to, to a wheel. I mean, these, these trivially simple machines sense their environment and respond. Um, and it seems to me anyway that, that what's going on in that machine is, it does not require the invocation or inference of any kind of subjective experience. It's, it's literally two wires that cross in the middle that connect light sensors uh, to wheels. Now, from a different perspective, maybe that's enough, but, but it, seems, it seems to me um, unlikely. But I think the other really good point you, you made is exactly this relationship between intelligence and consciousness and the fact that this is another part of this anthropocentric and anthropomorphic perspective that we bring because we can't directly observe consciousness in other systems we will use proxies and one of the commonly used proxies is intelligence right. and that's useful in some ways but i think the two get conflated very very readily and that's a problem because intelligence gives us as humans interesting ways of being conscious we can think out into the future and imagine counterfactual scenarios and so on but it's not the fundamental ground of our conscious experience at least i don't think so that that lies for me anyway um, much more in our experience of the body and of emotion and of mood and of this feeling of, of sort of being alive and prospectively continuing to be alive and that more fundamental level of experience that's much more likely to be shared among other species in a way that doesn't depend on intelligence at all you don't have to be smart in order to suffer but the potential for suffering is of course the basis on which we should make our ethical decisions about how we treat other systems so i was recently involved in a there's a campaign group called crustacean compassion uh, trying to alter legal frameworks for how initially um, people were treating um, octopuses and, and, other, and related creatures, but now more widely decapods, which include crabs and things like that. Now, there's no extraordinarily strong positive evidence that crabs are conscious, but you know, certainly uh, applying benchmarks based on human intelligence to resolve that question is, is wrong. And other criteria come in based on the precautionary principle that that you know, we should err on the side of avoiding potential suffering, even if their evidence for it is inconclusive as things stand. This is wonderful. Yes, just to, to comment on what you said in terms of my perception of reality in that sense, if we don't go from, you know, from the, the surface to the ultimate and have to solve the problem from the ultimate towards the surface, which means if you start from the physical, you have to know what the physical is. And what is the physical? The physical is atoms. No, it's ultimately what is an ultimate level. It's fields, quantum fields, and even now theories of unified field, where there is one reality or a few fields, whatever, you know, science knows. And it's from this that everything is built. And then we try to build what is consciousness. Now, if you take the idealist perspective, you have to start from consciousness. So let's say, okay, well, the primary thing is consciousness, which is non-physical. And now when you say that, you are bound to explain uh, how does it appear and become the objects that we see and how do things interact with each other. So I would take consciousness even further than the simplest uh, automaton or uh, you know a little bit of a car or something uh, that you create two wires etc to say that even a stone displays in the reaction to gravity a response that response is acknowledging in a sense not intellectually not anthropomorphically not intellectually this response is the minimal, meager, least amount of potential consciousness. It is not consciousness as we see it. It's not the consciousness that we are talking about. But if I start from the idealist point of view, I cannot but accept that consciousness is everywhere and is everything. And therefore, I justify it by saying that any interaction, any reaction, any response, even on the inorganic level, 
is the most meager little aspect of consciousness, which then builds up to become more complex consciousness and more complex consciousness. And in what we call life, it starts getting a sense maybe of not self necessarily, but protecting itself, reacting to things. And then as we go in the, in the, in the pyramid, if you like, we come to human consciousness and higher consciousness. So just to, to, to complete the thought on that point of view. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And I think the, the only thing I might push back a little bit on is, is this idea that taking a materialist perspective requires us to start from the most fundamental level of, of, of our understanding of what the universe is made of. Um, whether it's quantum fields or strings or, or whatever it might be, some sort of foamy stuff, I don't know. Um, that may be the case, but it may not be the case. I mean, there's been many examples in, in broadly physicalist science where previously mysterious phenomena have been explained without going all the way down. I mean, this is a sort of accepted principle of science in practice that you, you find the right level of description at which to explain a phenomena at a slightly higher level. So biology has done a very good job of explaining how life comes about, um, or how, well, not the origin of life, but the difference between a living and a non-living. And it doesn't, to explain that, it doesn't have to go right down into the depth of, of quantum physics. So that's a bit of an open question when it comes to consciousness, precisely because we haven't got a satisfactory answer yet. And there is, you know, I, I have a frustration, which is this assumption that the right level of description is neuron and connection. That, that's a very common kind of, and it's a useful working assumption because many of our computational models are built that way. You know, we build neural networks and so on, but the brain is much more than neurons and connections. Each neuron is very complicated. The brain's a chemical machine as much as an electrical network. And it's, it, can be dis, it can be understood at many, many levels of description, not just one, like wetware and then mindware as, you know, as we would apply to a computer with hardware and, and software. So I think there ought to be an, an openness. And there is, you know, some people are talking about this very eloquently now, an openness to what's the right granularity of thinking of physical systems um, to best explain consciousness, because every level is an abstraction. So there is, there is a sense in which I think we would both agree that, you know, does a neuron really exist? Well, you know, it, it's a concept. Um, something exists. What is it? But it's not like the, it's not even like the beautiful neurons that Ramon y Cajal drew at the beginning of neuroscience. No. They're yeah. all representations. They're all abstractions. Um, the question is whether they're useful abstractions, useful representations. That's beautiful. You, at the beginning, you described yourself as pragmatic, and that's important because we want to be able to function and to make sense of things and what works, works, what doesn't work, doesn't work. But when we are dealing with like the big questions in life, the meaning of existence and start to go into that field, and then even also asking the question, what is perception? What do I see? What are the noumena of things? What is the essence, the quiddity in the object? Does the object have an existence? Because if I'm creating my object through my actual imagination or consciousness or conceptualization, whatever the mechanics are behind it, whether they are a mechanic of consciousness or a mechanic of the physical interaction in the nervous system, I want to know, well, what is that thing that is in front of me ultimately that is creating that reaction? And that's why if we try to find what is the object ultimately and go deeper what it is made of and how it is constructed and where is its origin, it deconstructs in fact in front of our eyes the surface materialist side to a field of quantum fields and quantum mechanics and uh, non-locality and phenomena that we call weirdness and that's why uh, I can use this as an argument to say that to be an idealist is not after all so strange because maybe it is stranger to believe in the objects as they appear and not believe in the observer who is actually assessing the object from their perspective and seeing that there are different ways of assessing it 
be it on the classical level, be it on the human uh, nervous system level, on the animal level, or on the Large Hadron Collider level, or even deeper on the theoretical physics level, and you get to mathematics and, uh, you know, shapes and things. So it's just to be able to fathom the wholeness and see whether it is justified to be an idealist in that sense. Because people would discard it, you know, it's like if you talk, um, I'm sure you talked to Sean Carroll and you had some discussion with him, who is a very hard physicalist and, and very clear about it, a great scientist. Um, he would laugh off, in a sense, uh, about the idea of discarding the problem by saying um, consciousness is all there is. But it's also a dogma to say that the physical is all there is, because there are many questions to ask about it. First, what physical? The physical as I see it, or as you see it, or as the octopus sees it, or as the machine sees it, uh, or as the theoretical physicists see it? What is it? Where does it come from? Uh, how does it you know, emerge? And how does it create consciousness, which leads us to the heart problem? So these are the kinds of questions that uh, you know, should keep us all, I think, open-minded, which you are in a wonderful way. I, I, I do agree with this open-mindedness to this thing. So it's, um, yeah, I did speak with, with Sean and we had a, a wonderful conversation primarily about emergence, which I know has, has come up like on the sidelines of our chat now. And with, with the view again, how do we deal with emergence in a non-mysterious, sort of non-spooky way? And, and in my group with my colleagues here, Lionel Barnett and, and Adam Barrett and, and others, we've been trying to develop new mathematics for, for measuring emergent properties in, in sensible ways. So that was, yeah, which, which again does stem from this sort of basic physicalist perspective. Like there, are, there is a, there is a sort of microcausal level um, and there appear to be emergent properties at higher levels. How do we make sense of that appearance? And, is, and how do we make sense of it in, in a useful way? without sort of invoking new physical laws um, or forces at these higher levels. And I think that that's a very useful thing to do. But when it comes to you know, which, which metaphysical perspective that we feel most comfortable with, I, you know, it, it is, it's sort of up to each of us. Uh, and because I don't think it's completely est established that one is right and the others are all wrong. The question I always ask is which which is most useful, which is the most productive, which is the most fecund um, perspective to take. And you know, here there are some interesting things arising. So you know, there are some aspects of panpsychism, which is also easy to to discard and and make fun of, like conscious spoons and all that. But you know, there are some versions that mix interesting aspects of panpsychism and idealism, like Giulio Tononi's integrated information theory, you know, which, which says that it, it derives existence from consciousness. So in that sense, it's kind of idealist. Um, it, that, on that basis, that theory constructs a very interesting account of consciousness. You know, that actually has some explanatory power for why different experiences are the way they are, and um, and even like you know whether free will exists or not. Now there are other versions of integrated information theory which which are weaker and in fact which I have more sympathy with, which just again try to use interesting mathematical tools to explain aspects of phenomenology without without biting this bullet that consciousness you know, is primary and from that existence follows. But I still like the fact that that theory is is out there because it's taking a, 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 a metaphysical stance and fleshing out the consequences of that for our detailed understanding of the phenomena. And it's when a, a perspective can do that that I think it's, it's really worthwhile, if only to stop the rest of us from being lazy and just taking things for granted, which we should continually interrogate. That's wonderful. So the explanatory power is very, very important additional factor to consider in thinking about what intuition is the right or in the right direction. And also its practicality as you as you beautifully expressed. I wish I'll send you my book. It's called One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness. 
simple answer to big questions in life, in which I actually start from consciousness and explain how it can explain the physical and uh, explains many, many factors uh, in practical terms. But I, I want to come back to the concept of self and your experiments. Uh, if we have a few minutes more, I'm, if sure. we have time, yeah. it's fine. There are two things, in fact, I'd like to discuss is that you said the practicality of it. And now we come, it's not a reason why a logic should be accepted because it's useful necessarily. We want the truth to be the truth that makes sense and answers the questions. But in our world today, built on the physicalist perspective, we have conclusions about how we deal with each other, how nations deal with each other, how about property and belongings and values and all of that and all the ethics of it. And so we have this dispersed kind of different reality that is different from an individual to the other. And I go back to this because you said that if we start to accept each other as having a different point of view, maybe we will accept each other more. So there is that practical value, which is also very fundamental. But if we understand consciousness and its importance and the technologies that we can develop it, I know you come from a wonderful tradition. Uh, you were born in the UK, but your parents have come from uh, a wonderful tradition that I have studied very deeply, uh, you know, where the Atma, the self, is the self of everything and everyone, which also offers technologies of consciousness that can make our life individually better and make society better and contribute to society. So in terms of um, value and the telos and looking at meaning of life, from my perspective, if consciousness is primary, we will be doing things in a different way. Uh, and as we wake up and raise our consciousness and understand the unity of the underlying unity of life, that we are actually all one expressed in different limited perspectives, which we are saying, and use the technologies of consciousness, we have solutions that the strictly physicalist uh, point of view are going to have a hard time to believe in, because if everything is physical, then I can grab as much physical as I can, you grab as much as you can, and then we can't find a unity between ontology, epistemology, and ethics, and find ways to live. So from this kind of pragmatic perspective, uh, consciousness as primary is something that offers, offers a lot. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, but uh, we'll take also the, the question of self and self-awareness. Yeah, I mean, yeah let's, I mean, this, that's, an, that's kind of a provocative way to put it again. I mean, I think one, to be provocative back, you could equally say that maybe from an idealistic perspective, you can be right in some ways for the wrong reasons. And from a physicalist perspective, we can be wrong for the right reasons when it comes to how we avail ourselves of these uh, technologies of consciousness. You know, I, I think from whichever perspective you take, though, to be a bit, bit more conciliatory about it, that there are useful lessons to be learned for how we cultivate our own conscious experiences and, and those of others and respond to respect and, and engage with those of others. And certainly my own perspective of this the brain as a prediction machine view has a lot of convergence with, with certain ideas from, from Buddhism, uh, from various traditions in Buddhism that talk about the illusory nature of the self and the impermanence of things and and the insights one might get from meditation, and I know you have vastly more experience with meditation than, than I do, um, but some of the lessons that one might assimilate, I imagine I'm a very, very poor meditator, um, might be some of the realizations that we come to through this view of perception as inference, especially when, when applied to the self. Uh, but certainly there are, there are other other ways we might intervene in our experience through practice or through through tech, other kinds of material technologies that one would get to from a different metaphysical starting point. Um, that's entirely possible. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, the the jury is out <laughs> and uh, the discussion is open and we just look at all possibilities. It's just discussing consciousness and exploring consciousness from consciousness's level, which means 
you know, we can study consciousness effects on the brain and the coherence of the brain and what happens when one practices these techniques, which we have done with more than 600 scientific research studies that show that actually a mental practice can influence the body. Now one can turn it around and say, well, it's actually ultimately a mechanism of physiological change that creates the mental change rather than the mental creating the physical. It's, it's another discussion. When we, another we... discussion, but one can certainly agree that the two things go along together. And there's yeah. no, you know, for me, there's no conflict that, that you know, it's pretty clear. It's very interesting that meditative practices, for instance, have measurable uh, effects in the brain and the body. I, I would be, I, I'm, I'm not at all surprised that's the case. In fact, I completely would expect that to be the case and think it's, it's a good thing. Um, quite, you know, I, I would, I don't think it really matters to say, you know, what caused what in that sense, that they're, they're, you know, they're fundamentally coupled. You can't have one without the other. Beautiful. So let's, let's just go briefly, if you, if you don't mind, to the self, because in your discussions, broadly speaking, you have consciousness of the object, one category, and consciousness of the self, another question that rises, because it's kind of a different uh, category of consciousness, if you like, even though not a different substance, but a different phenomenon of consciousness. And you've made some amazing experiments and uh, came to the predictive value uh, of, of you know, the physiology interceptions and this experiments which you show that you've done with the hand that is uh, out of rubber or whatever. Would you mm. like to say something about this a little bit, please? Yeah, or, sure. Yeah. We, yeah, we can, we can touch on a couple of things here. So yeah, the, I mean, the trajectory of the book really does go from this idea, firstly, trying to understand the nature of our experience of the world as a kind of continually updated brain-based prediction, or as I use the term, a controlled hallucination. Um, with the control being extremely important, it's not arbitrary, it's linked to the world in ways that are guided by um, evolution for our survival. Um, and but then the second part of the book turns the lens inwards and says, well, okay, how do we explain the experience of being a self? And there's another little conceptual flip that goes on here, just as we had a little conceptual flip with our perceptual experience comes from the inside out more than the outside in. A naive perspective on consciousness might assume that the self, there's an essence of me somewhere inside my skull that is doing this perceiving and then deciding you know, what action to take, making a decision and so on. Um, but the flip here is no, the self isn't doing the perceiving, the self is another kind of perception. It's another kind of controlled hallucination that emerges from brain-based predictions but now these predictions have to do more with sensory information coming from the body rather than from the outside world so proprioception sense of body position interoception sense of the inter internal physiological state of the body and so on and and in the end get to this view that well actually that is the fundamental reason we have brains and have perception at all. It's not for perceiving the outside world fundamentally, let alone for doing things associated with intelligence, like crossword puzzles or philosophy or whatever. But brains are fundamentally in the business of regulating the body, keeping it alive, keeping our blood pressure where it needs to be. And to do effective regulation, you need to do prediction. Once your system is sufficiently complicated, that simple feedback won't suffice. A good controller has to embody a predictive model of what it what it's controlling, and so now you have uh, the origin of why brains are prediction machines. They're fundamentally regulating the body, and you now have an explanation of why emotion feels the way it does, and differently from a visual explanation. Emotions tend to feel some version of good or bad. You know? Obviously, that's a very, very, very simple characterization of emotion, but, but they have valence in the same way that visual experiences of the world have things like shape, color, and position and movement. The dimensionality is, is different. But valence matters for control, um, whereas in vision, we want to figure out where things are. So based on this, we can begin to understand the experience of self as not one thing, one essence of you or me that does the perceiving, but as a collection of related 
perceptual predictions about the body at different levels from the interior of the body to the body as an object to the experience of having a first person perspective and making voluntary actions all the way up to the experience then of being an individual with a continuity over time. But all of these things can come apart and we see this in psychiatry and neurology and we can also tease these things apart in the lab and this rubber hand experiment is, is you know, a classic experiment from psychology now from 1990s um, that, that shows the malleability of this part of what it is to be a self, this experience of what in the world is part of my body. And it turns out by this very simple manipulation of stroking a rubber hand in time with somebody's real hand while they're looking at the rubber hand and the real hand is hidden, many people have a little bit of a, it's, it's not that they really think and suddenly like accept the rubber hand as, as their hand. But for many people, the experience is a little bit weird. You know, it's like, feels like it's a bit part of my body, but, but not really. Um, and so that's quite malleable. In fact, though, what we've been working on, and this is led by my, my colleague, Peter Lush, um, which was just getting going when I was writing the book, was a very different way of thinking about this experiment. It's been used as a classic for, for many, many years to justify this idea that our experience of body ownership, you know, that this hand is my hand, is based on multi-sensory integration. Like I see a hand and I feel touch happening in the same place at the same time. Um, this might be going on to some extent, but what we found with the rubber hand illusion is that the effect can be pretty much entirely explained by how hypnotizable somebody is basically giving somebody a very strong expectation to have a particular experience. And then, well, if you're highly suggestible, which many of us are, I mean, there's a stable trait which we can measure, it's perhaps no surprise you'll have that experience. So there may be a different phenomenon underlying it or mechanism underlying it, but the lesson is, is the same, that what we experience as our body is a construction in the same way or in similar ways to what we experience as being out there in the world. It's not to be taken for granted. It's impermanent. And it's, it's in this sense that there is a really nice confluence with the idea that the self is, is illusory. And it's illusory in precisely the sense that the word should be used, that um, there's, there's a disconnect between how things appear typically in our experience and what underlies that thing. It's wonderful because one we agree, uh, I mean, from my perspective of consciousness again, because the, the idea is to present also the argument um, that our consciousness is the sum total of everything we have and our physiology. When I give lectures or people ask me questions, I say that our consciousness includes, you know, the consciousness of my liver, the consciousness of my heart of my brain, of course, which contributes more. But all of this together, uh, as you beautifully present, leads to a certain sense of who we are and a certain sense and ability also to be conscious from a certain perspective, which is our own. And um, ultimately, really, the experiment, uh, when I saw it, and I, I have heard of it before, but and again, when I looked at it from your perspective, it was like, what is the self then? What is that individual self that reacts to the rubber hand as if it's part of itself? And therefore, that self is truly, in a way, also a hallucination, illusory. And what is interesting in this is that it rejoins, if you push the limit, also the understanding that the individual self is an illusion, in fact, the individual self of who I am and that's what I am and this is my nationality, this is my name, this is my physical body, this belongs to me, this doesn't belong to me, these are my qualities, these are my shortcomings, is only one aspect of the true self. Again, we bring us back and I'm pushing the limit, I understand, we don't have to accept that in a, on a scientific platform right now, but uh, it has powerful explanatory power when you put it together. And pushing the limit is that actually there is only one self. And there is the ultimate self, which is one unbounded ocean of consciousness that then experiences itself from different perspectives. If you look at it from physics and modern physics theories, you can say there is that 
consciousness, so that cosmic being that is conscious, and then it is reflecting on itself from different perspectives. So when I say myself is that limited self, yes, it's true. So it's interesting how much we can agree on certain phenomena and, and uh, uh, observations and logical conclusions, but can have a different ultimate uh, explanation for it. So hallucination, yes, we both agree, which means it's only a perception of one aspect of the reality from this particular perspective. Uh, ultimately, there is nothing uh, in the physicalist perspective. Ultimately, there is everything which is the end and uh, uh, conclusion of such experiment, which says, in fact, you are also the rubber hand, you know? It's bizarre, but you are the rubber hand, you are the experimenter, you are the room, you are everything, because there is that one atma, one consciousness, one being, and it's interacting with itself in so many different and infinite number of ways, and suddenly, under a certain circumstance, something awakens, and you feel the rubber hand is also yours. Now you can transcend and see, you know, there is this higher states of consciousness we talked about, and one of those higher states of consciousness described particularly by my teacher from the Vedic tradition, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, is called unity consciousness. And in unity consciousness is the moment where the individual knows themselves to be unlimited and rises to experience everything as themselves. And they see in every object that it's the unified field. So if we go back to say what it is from a physics perspective, let's call it the unified field, that ultimately we are all the unified field and that you can actually know and experience this on the level of consciousness. And so in a funny way, your experiment triggers that thought also, rather than take us to the fact that there is no true self. Well, there is no small self as such, this is the hallucination, but what is the reality? The reality from my perspective is there is one unbounded self which is the unified field of all natural law, if you like to look at it from a physics perspective. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, there's a, yeah, just trying to think about the experience you described, this experience of, of unity. It's, it's fascinating because I think, on the one hand, it's a very powerful way of deconstructing assumptions about what experience of self or what conscious experience in general must be like in a similar way that well maybe not in a similar way but people who might take uh, psychedelics for the first time might suddenly realize that oh the way in which experience can happen is very different from how it how i previously assumed it must always happen right. with perhaps a very a very distinct subject object um border you know, relation dichotomy um and i think that's that's it's actually extremely useful because it can it can stop us taking things for granted or stop us confusing again the how things seem with with how things are um but then there might be the risk of making that mistake again from the different perspective and say oh now i see things how they actually are you know things are actually unified because that's how i now experience them in in this state and again to be provocative isn't isn't there the danger of just making the same mistake again but from a different uh, set of experiences well the the danger is there if on the pragmatic level the results are uh, not life supporting not leading to a better condition yeah. losing one's functionality in society and then that would be a danger but if it leads to greater happiness greater peace if it leads to greater enjoyment greater creativity better brainwave, co brainwave coherence, better functionality in life, then you'd say, well, that's great. So okay. that's, that's fine. Difference. So you're, you're like a utilitarian idealist then. In yes, sense. yes, oh, exactly. Like okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Very pragmatic also on that level. Yeah. I would say so. That's wonderful. We, you gave us time. It's really great to be with you. Um, any more last words or thoughts you'd like to share? 
I just thank you for the conversation. I, you know, I look forward to reading your your book as well. I'm sorry I haven't haven't read it yet. I I think it's it is very important to be open minded about you know the different metaphysical points that that we start from. So I've appreciated this discussion for for making that happen. Thank you. Thank you. It was a joy for me, a delight, and a lot to uh, to expose and to have our listeners and viewers enjoy. And also hoping you will they will all get your book and see how precise you are and how logical they are. And my hope is that they'll be able to translate it from an idealist point of view also. <laughs> Thanks again for the conversation. Thanks. Thanks to you.